it's so fun to hear them outside. That's new. And you guys sounded good this morning, too, so right on. Hey, uh, welcome online if you're joining us this morning and the parking lot. It's good to see everybody. Hope you all had a good Thanksgiving. Trust that you did. And we're just going to get right into it this morning. We are here to meet with God. Uh, we're anticipating that he's here right now to meet with us. So let's open up our hearts and give him praise. Thank you. Thank you, God, for what this season we're entering into means. God, I, I pray that we would catch truly the majesty, the wonder of, of, of this season. It wouldn't just be 
lost with all the, the busyness and all that. And, but Lord God, we would, as we sing that song and think about what it means for God to come to earth, what it means for you to be here with us, God. Oh, it means so much. It means so much for our daily lives, Lord. It, it means so much to the point that that's why we're here this morning, God. We want to meet with you. We want to be around other believers and, and the family of God to worship you together. And so we invite your presence. We say, Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Oh, Lord, would you do a mighty work in us today? God, I thank you for how you speak to us. You say, to those who draw near to you, God, you draw near to them. What a wonderful thing that is, Lord God, that you're, you want to be near to us today. And we, we love that, Lord. And so we open up our hearts to you, God. We, we lay down our lives to you today. And we say, whatever it is that you see fit to do in me, let that be done, God. Because that's the best thing that could be done. Far better than my plans, God. Your thoughts are far higher than my thoughts, Lord. And so we come together collectively and we say hallelujah. We worship you today, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, if, again, if you are online, we'd love to hear from you, especially if it's your first time. Click at the top. I'm new here, and we'll make that connection. In person, it's just as easy to do. There's no button to click, but you can go over to the red tent over there. It says next steps on the table. You hear the bell going off right on cue. That's good stuff. And uh, they'll help make a connection. We got a little gift uh, just to say, hey, welcome to Crosswinds Church. Worship songs are on the app. If you ever see me on my phone during the service, it's because I'm looking at the worship lyrics and I'm not checking Instagram or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sing along with a band. And I, that was, that's, that's a, one of those seasonal songs I hear once a, once a year that we just heard. And so I, I couldn't recall the lyrics. It was nice to have them there. So thank you, tech team, for putting those up. Uh, a couple of highlights is today is our special in-gathering offering. It's our in-gathering service we've been talking about. Many of you have been praying about, God, how would you have me give uh, above and beyond my, my regular offering? There's a few projects around the church we want to take care of, just stuff that needs to get done, um, and we use this, this uh, offering this time of year in order to put it towards that. And so you can find out more about that at the Next Steps table. Make sure today, because there are a few offerings in this service, it's, it really is a, it's a special service today. I mean, we've got the in-gathering uh, service. It's it's also Communion Sunday, and so we're coming together, and, and you know, we, we do our regular offering, we've got in-gathering coming, you pray, pray about that, but also on Communion Sunday, um, if the Lord leads you to this, we have a brotherhood offering. You might say, wow, that's a lot. Well, yeah, it doesn't typically happen, but they're converging today. The brotherhood offering is really um, an opportunity to anybody in, in need in the church, which um, time to time needs arise and can't make rent or can't make my mortgage this month, well, that's where we come together as a family of God, and we support each other in that. So make sure your offering is clearly marked what you're giving to. You can do the same thing on the app as well. Just indicate uh, what that's going to. Uh, we are wanting to reach out this, this year uh, beyond, well, we're already outside the four walls of the church, so that makes it easy. We want to reach out to the community, and we already know that there's some families that uh, could be blessed this time of year. Uh, that's why we're doing this thing called Crosswinds cares. And you can find out more information in the next tip, steps table about this, but we're going to uh, basically put these food baskets together and a gift for each child in that family. And we're going to find some families that are part of our worlds to come together and bless them this year. Christmas concert is coming up December 20th. Wow. Can you believe that? That's coming up. That's insane, isn't it? December 20th, 5 p.m. We're going to have a concert here and you're going to want to put that on the calendar in advance. This will be a great opportunity as well to invite family and friends and coworkers and things like that. So December 20th, Christmas concert. Stay connected. Uh, many ways to do that. Facebook, uh, our YouTube website. I think that's all I have this morning. And so uh, I don't know about you, but it's, just a, it's been a really good week. And it's been, a, it's been one of those weeks where God's brought me to a place of realizing just how much I need him. And that can be a real, like, scary thing at times, because it's like, okay, God, all right, where are you going with this? But at the same time, uh, it's such a good thing. We're in good hands with God. And so wherever you're at this morning, I would just say, 
let's open up our hearts. During these songs, this is an opportunity for us to say, to, to get right with God, to get real with God, to give him praise. And so just to really encourage everybody here um, to open up your heart to God this morning. And, and I believe he also has a really amazing message for us from his word. And so you guys ready? All right, let's go for it. Let's go. 
thank you for this time of Advent, for this time when we remember uh, what your son Jesus Christ did on our behalf, how he left his uh, heavenly throne, came to this earth, died on a cross, and, and uh, returned to you. And Father, all for us, that is the great gift of Christmas. It's the, it's the reason we give gifts at Christmas. It's a reminder of the greatest gift of all, which is the gift you sent us of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may we, throughout this month, just be reminded of that gift. And Lord, may that prompt us to not want to hold on to it for ourselves. May we also want to give gifts to those in our worlds. May we want to see those uh, that we know, our friends, our neighbors, our, our co-workers. Lord, may we want them to experience this gift of your son, Jesus Christ, as well. Speak to us this morning, Lord. I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. We give this time to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to be here this morning. I want to remind you as well that next Sunday, we're also going to be having right after the service, a business meeting. And uh, we're going to be, uh, the elders are recommending two couples for membership. They are uh, Nate and Samantha uh, Baliano and Bonaventure. Okay, yeah, I got it right this time. Here's a challenge though. Bonaventure Dusabimana and Laura Nader are also coming for membership. And so if you're a member, we hope to see you there. Also, we're going to be seating our nominating committee. That's a standing committee that we have as part of our, uh, part of our church and uh, the business that we need to accomplish. So that'll be right after the service. Shouldn't take too long, but uh, we need to make that announcement for you. Well, as I've said a couple of times, you've heard it this morning. You've probably noticed the music is a little different. We are into uh, Advent. This is the first Sunday of Advent. I know some of you are thinking, well, we just had Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> And the Advent season is that time of the year, of course, when we remember the advent of Jesus Christ entering this world. And you back up four weeks uh, from Christmas, and that's the first Sunday of Advent. We have here, as we do every year, our Advent wreath. Again, I was talking with somebody this morning, and we were saying how everything is different this year. We're having to work out all the, 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 the different ways of doing things now that we're out front here, and it's, it's a little simpler inside, mainly because we're used to doing it in there. We've got it sort of down. We do this every year. It's a tradition, and it strikes me that one of the neat things about being out front here and having everything different is we have to really think about it all over again. You can't just fall into your normal patterns of this is the way we always do it. We have to actually think about it now. And so we have our Advent wreath. By the way, the, the term Advent means uh, to come, okay? And what essentially Advent is, the Advent season, is it's a countdown to the coming of Jesus Christ uh, on Christmas Eve. And so each week, we have, a, we have a four candles here that we'll be lighting. And then finally, uh, on Christmas Eve, at our Christmas Eve candlelight service, which we are having, and uh, we'll be lighting the Christ candle, which is in the middle. Uh, the first one, well, first off, let me give you a little information about this. You'll notice there are different colors of candles. The colors mean something. And so you have purple candles and you have a uh, pink, a red candle. And actually, this is not set right. This should be like that. There you go. There. <laughs> so the third week is actually the pink candle. And so uh, today we're going to light the first candle, which is the candle of hope, the candle of prophecy. Next week we'll be lighting uh, the uh, candle of love. Uh, I'm sorry, the candle of peace, which is also known as Mary and Joseph's candle. Then the third week you'll have the uh, candle of uh, joy, which is the shepherd's candle. And then finally on uh, the fourth week we light, we light the angel's candle and then culminating with the Christ candle candle. The different colors, purple candles, represent the fact that Jesus Christ is king. You know, he came from his, from his throne down to this earth. The uh, candle of joy is pink. And when you think about it, that's really what the Advent season is all about. It's about the, the royalty of Jesus coming to us and the joy of the season. And so as we light this candle, we remember as today is the candle of hope and prophecy and we're going to be thinking about that today and talking about that. And in your Bibles, if you have uh, your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to Hebrews 11. And as we enter 
This Advent season, one of the things we want to remember, and that's the purpose behind the hope, the candle of hope, is that for thousands of years, people were waiting for the coming Messiah. They were believing God's promises. They were looking forward. And you can go all the way back to the very uh, uh, third chapter of the Bible, Genesis 3.15, where you get the first prophecy of the coming Messiah. And uh, in Hebrews 11, if you go to Hebrews 11, chapter, uh, uh, starting in verse 35, we read about, well, th- actually throughout the entire book of Hebrew, the entire chapter of Hebrews 11, it's, it's known as the hall of faith. And in this hall of faith, you have all these men that are talked about who were faithfully waiting for the coming, for the promise of God. Men like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, and there's many others. And summing up, as he talks about all these different individuals who were waiting for the hope of the Messiah and were believing God's promise, it says, starting in verse 35, others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mocking and flogging and further chains and imprisonment. And they were stoned and they were sawn in two and they were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, people of whom the world was not worthy. These are the people that are waiting for God's promise. This is the, the things that they were experiencing. It goes on. They wandered in deserts, in mountains, and sheltering in caves and even holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, catch this. This is verse 39. They did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. In other words, their entire life, they're waiting for this promise from God and they're enduring all of this persecution that he writes about. And yet they never saw the promise fulfilled in their lifetime. They were looking forward to the promise of God. And in verse 40, what God is, what, what uh, the writer of Hebrews is really getting at there is that God was holding off so that they could then enjoy this along with us. Just as they were looking forward to the coming of Christ, we also are looking backward at the coming of of Christ. We are all in this together. And throughout scripture, I mentioned the the first prophecy of the coming Messiah way back in the book of Genesis. You actually have those that have done the the math. They've actually calculated that there are over 300 prophecies predicting the Messiah, talking about different aspects, where he would be born, uh, what kind of family he would come from. You know, very, some of them very specific, some a little more general. But when you look at these 300 prophecies, they are all fulfilled in one person, and that is Jesus Christ. And if you were to calculate out the odds of that being true, it's, an, it's a huge immeasurable number. And, and I don't know about you, but that gives me a tremendous level of confidence. And I want us to think about that as we light this candle this morning, as we think about the prophecies of Jesus, as we think about those who were waiting in hope and enduring even as they were waiting. They had hundreds of years of hardships, not knowing why. Why why do these things happen to us? Why are we going through these struggles? Why are these trials happening to me? Why are we being persecuted this way? And today we can keep asking that question, can we? Why why does a loving God allow suffering? Why does a loving God uh, allow things to happen to us that doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, in keeping with what we expected from being a Christian? I mean, what, what, what did I do to deserve this? Many here at Crosswinds have been asking questions like that. Why are the things that are happening in our world happening right now? What did we do wrong? It's a good question to ask. Because sometimes when we look at the things that we go through, sometimes we have done something wrong. I mean, how, how silly would it be if you, you know, someone were to say, oh my goodness, Lord, Lord, tell me, why do I keep getting these parking tickets? Why is it happening, Lord? What have I done to deserve this? Well, you, you illegally parked, that's why. And in the same way in Galatians 6, it reminds us, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a person sows, This also shall they reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So in sometimes, guys, it it is something that we have done. Sometimes we're experiencing the, the persecution because we've done something. Sometimes it's just the world we live in. 
You know, sin is all around us. In fact, Jesus promised us that there would be trouble. John 16, he says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Amen? <laughs> right? But take courage, Jesus says. I have overcome the world. If you ride in a car with a drunk driver, you can get hurt. Maybe not because of anything you've done, but because you're in an environment where it's, the chances are much greater that something is going to happen to you. Well, that's the whole world that we're in right now. And then there are those times when there are no apparent reasons. There's nothing that I seem to be doing. In fact, like these prophets that we're talking about this morning in Hebrews, I've been doing the right thing. I've been seeking after God, and yet still there seems to be suffering. We, uh, a few years ago, we went through the book of Job, and in Job, you have this righteous man, and, and, and God allows uh, persecution to come into his life, and over and over again, Job is asking, oh, Lord, why is this happening? What have I done? And his friends show up, and they're telling him, you must have done something, and they talk about it, and they talk about it. They discuss it chapter after chapter after chapter, on and on and on, and guess what? In all of the questions that, that Job is asking, there's one question he never gets answered, and that is, why is this happening? God never answers that question because he wants Job to have faith and just know that I am here. I am, I am uh, I'm, I'm, I'm superseding over all of this. I am in control. Jesus and his disciples at one point in Scripture were passing by, and they saw a blind man. And his disciples said to Jesus, Rabbi, who is it that sinned? Was it this blind man? You know, or was it his parents so that he was born blind? It was believed back then that if you had bad things happen to you, much like Job's friends, you must have done something really bad to have this happening to you. God must be punishing you. So his, his, his disciples are asking Jesus, essentially, it, it's the question we still ask right to this day. Was it him or was it his environment? You know, is it nature or is it nurture? And Jesus answers them and he says, guess what? It was neither it wasn't that this man sinned. It wasn't that his parents sinned. It was so that the work of God will be displayed in his life right now. And what does Jesus do? He heals him of his blindness. Now think about that. Talk about, talk about commitment this morning. I mean, you, you talk about committing to things, right? Committing to, uh, uh, to, to teach a Sunday school class or to help out with our children's ministry. Talk about, commi I'm, I'm committed, and hopefully you are as well, to reaching out to my world, to, to praying for those people that are on my car, those eight to 10 uh, who are friends and neighbors and acquaintances and, and people that just show up in my life. But here's a guy who was blind for years for this very moment. That's what his life was all about. That's what God had called him to. <laughs> Some of you know the old account of the chicken and the pig. The chicken and the pig decided, you know, one day they, were, they wanted to give a gift to God. And uh, they thought and thought about it. And finally, the chicken says, you know what? I know what we can give God. I know what we can give, uh, give him as a, uh, as a special gift that only we can give. Let's give him a, a bacon and eggs breakfast. <laughs> to which the pig said, well, okay, it sounds good. And it sounds unique. And it's uniquely ours. But, uh, you know, for you, that's an offering. For me, it's a total commitment. <laughs> well, how about you this morning? How are you giving to the Lord? How are you doing in your service, in your commitment to Him? Are you giving Him a, a, just a, a contribution, just an offering, or are you making a total commitment? And, and just what is a total commitment? What is it that, that, that God wants? He wants everything. He wants everything. He wants us to be like Christ. And what did Jesus do? He gave everything. That's what the Advent is all about. It's the beginning of Jesus coming down from heaven, leaving his throne and coming into our world, giving it all ultimately on the cross. The Apostle Paul wanted to be powerful. The Apostle Paul wanted his life to count. He wanted to live a life of purpose, as we often say today. And so he had his credentials, and in, first, in 2 Corinthians, we often read about it in chapter 11, where he talks about all the things that he had going for him. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a, a Pharisee. As to the law, I was perfect. And apparently, you know, and, and it, ultimately, he, he boasts about these things and talks about how I must be crazy to be boasting about this because he, he wanted to be a humble man. But apparently, he had trouble using all of these things that he had to give God. 
He had, he, there, there was something that was holding him back. He called it his thorn in the flesh. And he said, if I didn't have this thorn, if I didn't have this thing, whatever it was that's holding me back, I could be so much more successful. Think about that. I mean, it's, it strikes me that the blind man that Jesus healed could have been praying that a whole lot too, could have been talking to God a lot about that. I mean, how much more uh, usable could I be for you, Lord, if I didn't have this blindness, if I, if I didn't have this thing holding me back from being able to be all that I can be for you? And so what did the Apostle Paul do? He says in uh, verse 7 of, Ch- of 2 Corinthians 12, he says, Because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And how does Paul respond to that? (laughs) Most gladly, therefore, he says, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I delight in weakness, in insults, in distresses, in persecutions, in difficulties on behalf of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's be honest. That sounds crazy. (laughs) I mean, mean, if, if you want to get a job and you fill out a resume you're not going to put all your weaknesses on there, right? Unless you don't want the job. You're going to put the things that you're strong about. You're going to put the things that you're, you're proud of yourself. And yet, if I write it for God, apparently it ought to be the other way around. What does God want to see in us? In Psalm 51, 16, we read, For Lord, you don't delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are what? They are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. You see, we tend to think that God is on this performance mentality. We tend to think that if I do more things for God, he's going to like me more. God says, no, that's not the way I operate. I don't want your stuff. I want you. Now, your stuff will probably follow if I've got you, but that's the key. In fact, you know, we've talked about we're taking three different offerings today. Don't think that, man, if I give a really big offering, that's going to put me in good graces with God. It's not about the offering. It's about your heart. And if your heart isn't right, keep your money. (laughs) Don't, Don't bother to give it. Because what does God say right here? I don't delight in sacrifice. I don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. No, I want you. I want your heart. I want total commitment. There's times when I felt really good about how things are going. For instance, here at the church, you know, the offerings are good. The staff is is enjoying, you know, working together. We're not having interpersonal issues like we sometimes have. The the people in my church are doing well. They're getting along. They're they're stepping up. And I I feel like, you know, the future looks good. Things are, are well in hand. But when I consider what I base those feelings on, and I'm speaking personally right now, Quite often, I base that on how I feel about things. I, 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 feel, I, I base that on what I'm able to achieve and what I am able to accomplish and how I, as the pastor, am able to lead this church into new and exciting things. Guys, that's all about me at times. How different would it be if I considered things from God's perspective? And then, like Job or Peter or Paul, as I, as I re-examine my life, as I re-examine our church and my commitment, I might say, as Paul does in Philippians 3, 7, whatever things were gained to me, these things I've counted as loss for Christ. More than that, I, can t- I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them mere rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of this faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. That's the commitment demonstrated at the Last Supper. And that's what he's asking of each of us when we talk about total commitment. I believe, guys, he is taking us to the next level. I think he's taken a lot of things away from us these last eight or nine months. 
I think he's, he's shaking everything up. He's making it difficult. He's, he's causing us to have to really examine what, what, how, do I, how do I continue on when I'm not as comfortable, when I'm not getting things done my way, when, when people aren't agreeing with me. I mean, over and over, we are being bombarded with these things because I don't think he wants us to be comfortable. I think he is intentionally shaking us up because he's taking us to a new level of commitment as individuals and as a church. He wants total commitment from us here in Crosswinds Church. And this morning, as we participate together in communion, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the commitment that it took for Jesus Christ to do what we are remembering. Again, communion is something that we do every couple of months here. And we try to space it out so that it's not so often that it just becomes, yeah, that's that thing we do. That's that thing that, you know, we, that's one of the reasons we don't do it every week. We don't want it to just become an empty tradition. We truly want to think about it. And today, I'd like you to think about it in this context. What did it take for Jesus Christ to do what he did that night? that he was betrayed, that night that he gave up his life, that night, that that day that he went to the cross. What did it take? It took a total commitment, not just an offering. And when I participate in a communion service, what am I saying? I'm saying that I am identifying with that. I am making that commitment. And as I think about the various ways we could respond today, I think about, here's, let me give you a couple here. What do I do with suffering? What do I do with the struggles, with the trials that I am dealing with right now? Well, one thing I could do is I could pray for God to remove it. And that's, that's totally okay. You know, it doesn't mean we have to just live under it. We can pray that God would remove it. We can come boldly before his throne of grace and make our requests before God. But be careful. Because you see, there are those that would say, go before that throne of grace and presume upon God. Tell God, you owe me this. You know, long, but they won't say it like that. They'll say it things like, claim the victory. Uh, just have enough faith. And if you don't, and if you don't see uh, victory, if you don't see things happening, well, then you just didn't have enough faith. Guys, it, faith isn't the issue. Well, it is an issue. But realize this. Jesus said that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And he chose a mustard seed very intentionally because it was the smallest possible seed there was growing into a a giant plant. The point is, as we pray, we've said this many times, prayer is not to change God. Prayer is to change me. You know, life is horrible, and then you hopefully die at the end. Guys, that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to live abundantly. Even if we're under the the struggles, even if we're, we're dealing with suffering and hardships, No matter the circumstances that we are in, he wants us to experience the abundant life. Another thing I can do is begin to see it for what it is, that God is working on me. God is not finished with me yet. There is iron sharpening iron going on here. And you know, when iron sharpens iron, if you've ever done that, you'll know there's a lot of heat and a lot of sparks, and sometimes it doesn't feel good. And I pray that we as a church and we as individuals would, would, would say what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3.10, that I want to know Christ, catch what he says here, and the power of his resurrection, that sounds good, right? And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Wow. <laughs> in other words, what Paul is saying, I want to totally commit myself to Jesus Christ to be like him in every aspect, to not pick and choose. I want, the, I want this part of Jesus, but nah, you know, what's that old hymn? Take my life and let me be consecrated, Lord to, Lord to thee. And I've often said that uh, in reality, I'll speak for myself. If I were to write that song, it would be more along the lines of, Lord, take my life, but let me be. You know, you can have me, Lord, but, uh, you know, if, if it means suffering, if it means hardship, if it means struggle, then, uh, you know, just, just keep that to yourself. No, total commitment is that God has a plan even in that. Number four, I can allow God to change me this morning. I can submit to him. Ephesians 5.18 tells us that we are to not be drunk with wine wherein to excess, but rather be filled, be controlled, be empowered by His Spirit. 
And that's an ongoing thing, as I've shared many times. You, know, you ought to write it into your Bible. When it says, be filled with the Spirit, it's a continuous action. It's talking about there. It's something that we have to continually do. I often tell people to write in, be being filled, okay? It's something that I have to decide daily, moment by moment sometimes, especially you know, when, 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 when issues come into my life, sometimes when certain people come into my life, I have to say, Lord, <laughs> fill me, control me, empower me, because if I don't, I I start to slide. I start to become the problem. And I would encourage you this morning, that's how the Apostle Paul got through this. That's how the prophets in Hebrews 11 got through this. It wasn't because they were stronger or they had more self-confidence or more, you know, more stick to It was because they appropriated the power of God in their lives. They said, Lord Jesus, fill me with your spirit control me, empower me. I give this to you. And out of that came the strength that they needed to live their lives. Guys, we can have this hope, this certainty that this candle represents this morning. And that's, by the way, is biblical hope. It's not the, I hope hope so. I sure hope Jesus comes. No, the hope of Christ is the certainty of Christ. The hope of, uh, the blessed hope is the, the certainty of the second coming of Jesus Christ that we're looking forward to. Just as they were looking forward to the first coming of Christ, we are also looking back at the first coming, but we're also hoping for that second coming, that, that certain coming of Jesus. And like those Israelites, and we, were, we remember the prophecies related to that this morning, and we are encouraged by it. And when we do that, then we will truly be able, as we saw last week, as 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So there's the question. Will you allow God's Spirit to change you today? Will will, will you allow him to control you, to empower you? And as we prepare to celebrate in communion together, the worship team can come up. And um, as we prepare, we're going to go to a time of prayer where we take, the Apostle Paul said that before we come to communion, we need to examine ourselves. I need to see what, because you see, when I'm participating in communion, what am I saying? I am saying that I am identifying with Christ But I'm also identifying with the body of Christ, my brothers and sisters. In the context in the the book of 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul was talking to a church about uh, how they were doing communion wrong and what was wrong about their communion. It was that they had issues and fights. You know, we spent uh, over a year in the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians, and we know that that church in Corinth uh, was not an exemplary church unless you want to, you know, hold them up as an example of what not to do quite often. And so they were fighting, they were arguing, even their communion services, which included a love feast. He says people would come and take all the food so that others couldn't get enough food. And they had people in places of honor and other people, you know, had the cheap seats. And that there's all these divisions in their church. And so when we come together for communion, I'm not just talking about the, the vertical communion between me and God. We're talking about the horizontal communion between us. And it's that horizontal communion between us that is going to speak to our worlds as they see our unity and our oneness and our love for each other. And so as we go to him in prayer, I want to encourage you to pray and ask God, as King David said, to search your heart and show you if there is anything that might prevent you from honestly taking communion today so that the communion isn't a lie. In other words, if I'm, if I'm just going through the motions and just doing it, and yet I do have an issue with my brother, or I do have an issue with the Lord, or there's, there's unconfessed sin in my life, that's the point to take care of it. Ask God to show you that thing as he brings those things to mind, and trust me, he will. <laughs> I do this regularly, especially before preaching, every Sunday morning. Lord, show me, and then sometimes it's like, whoa. <laughs> I, I sometimes go into it thinking, yeah, I'll just pray the prayer, you know, show me God, and then I'll go on to the next thing because I don't know of anything. But man, trust me, he answers that prayer. Show me, Lord. And then, well, there's this, and there's this, and there's this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and what does it say in 1 John 1, 9? If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if, as we do that, 
then we take care of those relationships and we can come, as Paul, the Apostle Paul says, we can come to this communion time in a worthy manner. Because as he says, you don't want to come unworthy. You don't want to come with all those, those issues and, and unconfessed sins in your life because some of people have gotten sick and some have even died as a result of that, as a result of that, that level of hypocrisy. And so he says, as you, as you offer this up, then realize you are forgiven. It's taken care of. It's dealt with. And then you're prepared for communion. So we're going to take a few minutes. The worship team is going to play, and we're going to, uh, to uh, prepare our hearts. Listen to what the Lord wants to say to you. Let me just open us up in prayer. Father, I thank you for this time of remembrance that you have planned into our, our church calendar. Just like Advent is that regular time of the year. This is a regular thing, Lord, that you have told us that we are to do until you return, until you come. And Father, it's a good time for us to sort of press the reset button, to go back and to be reminded, yeah, what does it take to be a, a devoted, fully devoted follower of you? What are the issues in my life? What are the things that need to be dealt with? So Lord, I ask right now that you will just uh, show us these things, that you will, uh, Lord, show me where I need to ask for that forgiveness for that relationship that I've been dealing with, for those, those, uh, those issues that I've been, I've been having in my life, for the things in my relationship with you, Lord, would you just speak to us each individually right now in these next few moments of silence? Speak to us, Lord. God, there's a lot of commitments going around this place this morning, things that we either sense that you're speaking to us or things that you've already spoken to us this week or maybe something this, this morning that really just hit us. And God, and, and as we're making these commitments, God, we're, we're remembering the fact that you made the first commitment before we even got here, God. We, we know that, Jesus, you came, you, you lived a life, and you... You, you were crushed for us, God. You, you were fully, totally committed for our life. And so, God, we place our, our lives in your hands. These, these things we're thinking about right now, Lord, we, we bring it to communion. We confess those sins, Lord. We repent. We turn from those ways to turn to you, Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness that's over our life, Lord, as we just say, here I am. I believe. I turn I want to follow you. Please forgive me. And that forgiveness is readily available. And so, Father, as we just do that sort of business with you right now, it leads us into this first part of communion. Thank you for this moment, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you take the first top of this communion packet, you see the little wafer here, which is a little symbol of the body of Christ, the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us. He was pierced for our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. He didn't deserve it. We deserved it. But yet he went through it because of his great unconditional love for you and myself. So let's take this bread, as Jesus said, in remembrance of that sacrifice. Similarly, at that 
last supper that he had with his disciples, not only did he reinterpret the bread, surprising them, you see, changing things up is, is nothing new. <laughs> Jesus did it at that table. These guys who'd gone their whole lives with Passover meals, knew the lines, knew what was expected, and yet Jesus comes up with, this is my body, which is broken for you. I can see them now, like, what, what did he say? What? This, what? <laughs> and then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. As you drink of this, remember me and realize that I'm not going to drink of this cup again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. I like that. Because as we drink it, we're looking back to what Jesus did for us as he shed his blood uh, symbolized by this drink. But he's also directing us to look forward to that day when we will once again be together with him in the second advent. Let's do this in remembrance of him. i
God, we thank you. Thank you for that love that's enduring. Thank you, God, for meeting us in this place today. Lord, speaking to us and meeting with us in in this time of communion, Lord, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for all those bits of transformation that's happening all over this place today, God. We have found our peace. Lord, we have found our hope. We have found our rest. And so for that matter, God, we just pray in the name of Jesus that those three would remain on us this week as we follow after you throughout the week. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Thank you for what you've yet to do. And most of all, Lord, thank you for who you are. It's in your wonderful name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.